information, opinions, data, and statements contained in this podcast are not necessarily those of the U.S. government or the National Institutes of Health and should not be interpreted, acted on, or represented as such. Welcome to the first episode of the National Institutes of Health Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Women's Engagement Committee podcast. I'm Joy Postel, the Women's Employment Portfolio Strategist and Chair of the Women's Engagement Committee. The National Institutes of Health is part of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the nation's leading medical research agency, making important discoveries that improve health and save lives. Thank you for joining us for today's podcast. Over the next several months, the NIH Women's Engagement Committee will be hosting insightful discussions born out of the qualitative and quantitative data around women. Today's discussion on women in IT will be broken up into multiple parts to focus in depth on specific issues of interest. For this podcast, we are honored to be in conversation with the director of the National Library of Medicine, Dr. Patricia Brennan, and the director of communications for the Center of Information Technology, Ms. Sarah Moffitt. Before I get into their distinguished bios, I wanna share some eye-opening information about women in technological fields. We have seen some great women in tech history over the years, Dr. Grace Hopper, Hedy Lamar, Mary Wilkes, Katherine Johnson, just to name a few. They've certainly left their marks on society, but according to Built-In, in 2021, only about 25% of the jobs in technology are held by women, leaving women grossly underrepresented in the field. Moreover, moreover women only hold about 14% of software software engineering, and 25% of computer science-related jobs in the U.S., and 37% at the NIH. Recent women in STEM statistics show that women hold about 18% of undergraduate computer science degrees. Because computer science research jobs are expected to grow by 19% by 2026, it's time to talk about this. But before we do, allow me to introduce my guest, Dr. Patricia Brennan. Dr. Brennan is the director of the National Library of Medicine, NLM, at the National Institutes of Health, where she oversees the world's largest biomedical library. Welcome and thank you, Dr. Brennan. Thank you very much. My next guest is Ms. Sarah Moffitt. Sarah is an IT communications and change management expert, currently serving as director for communications and digital experience in NIH's Center for Information Technology. Welcome and thank you, Sarah Moffitt. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for, for being here. My first question I'd like to direct toward Dr. Brennan. When some of us think of information technology, we may not readily see the connection between IT and health research. How does the mission of NIH intersect with information technology? Thank you very much for letting me start with this question. As you may know, NIH is embarking on its very first IT strategic plan. Information technology is core to the operations of the NIH and to the science we produce. It's essential to be able to recognize that as research grows, what grows, what helps it to grow is the information infrastructure that supports not only communication, but data capture, data analysis, and data presentation. We recognize, for example, that team science is a critical part of the biomedical research enterprise and linkages through information technology networks, internet too, and virtual engagement has enabled us to, to partner with investigators around the world. In the clinical care arena, including in our own clinical center, uh, here at the NIH, the care of patients is often monitored through electronic devices and the integration of that care with the care across the rest of their everyday living is managed through electronic health record systems. So I would say health and biomedical sciences has become an intense information technology enterprise, no longer sufficient to be the creative response and activities of a biological 
scientist or a good clinician, but supported, enabled, and extended by information technologies. Everything from telemedicine to the cryo EM, the major electron microscope that we have now on the campus that's allowing us to peer into single cells. We could not do science without information technology. Wow. Thank you for that. That explains a lot. I think I have a much better picture of, of what it is that you do and what your office is about. Uh, Sarah, can you tell us a little bit about why you chose this career path? What intrigued you about it? Yeah, thanks so much. And Dr. Brennan, I'm just so impressed and so happy to be sitting here virtually next to you. you. This, is, this is quite this is quite a thrill for me. Um, so I I sort of fell into this field, stumbled into IT, like uh, I think a lot of people do. My father was a senior level programmer and developer at the United States Secret Service. So I grew up around techie stuff. I grew up listening to tech speak and just sort of figuring out technology on my own. Um, and I had an opportunity to work as a technical trainer at a help desk at the FAA. And that was my first IT job almost 20 years ago. I had zero idea what I was doing. And so I just started looking through the, the help desk tickets and noticing where the patterns were. And so if like 15 or 20 people said they were having problems with a certain program, I would go and learn how to use the program and then write training for regular people on how to use it. Um, and I birthed FAA's technology on the fly training program. Uh, I'm a big fan of puns. So from there, different roles. I had different roles. I was an ISO, I've been a DBA. Um, and through those different roles, it helped me evolve my interest and skills and realize that my skills in communication and talent development and helping organizations get through big technology changes, um, that's where I really love to be. And that's where my talent and skills developed. And I have been incredibly fortunate to meet wonderful people along the way who have encouraged me in this field, despite the fact that I still cannot properly code a single thing. <laughs> well, Sarah, I can barely turn my computer on, so uh, my hat goes off to you. <laughs> Very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Dr. Brennan, uh, why did you choose this career path? In 1975, as a student graduating from a program in nursing, I read an article about computers and what they were doing for nurses. Mm -hmm. And although I had planned to, to follow into a career in psychiatric nursing, I became increasingly curious about how we could harness this power for nurses. The most complicated thing a nurse face is how to make a decision now, not knowing what the future will bring in response to that decision, whether it's Medicaid a patient, comfort a family member or call a, co a colleague. So I was interested in decision support and the only way to study decision support in the late 1970s was to look into computer science and engineering. But what was lucky, very fortunate in my career is that I managed to connect with an engineering team that helped me to understand the systems around work and how to integrate technology as a part of those systems. Over time, I realized that if we were going to make advances in health in our society, we had to get these powerful tools into the hands of patients. Having them in clinics and doctor's offices and research labs was not gonna be enough. So most of my career has been spent building, testing and evaluating technologies to support people living at home alone. Very interesting. I, you know, I'm even thinking about the days when you would go to the doctor and they would have to write everything down on a piece of paper. And, you know, before there was the system, you know, and I'm like, are you going to really collect all of this information? But it, wow, that seems incredible. But I've, it is life changing. It really is. It's, it's fantastic. Uh, I'm going to switch gears just a little bit and ask um, either of you, can you tell me, well, we know that the data suggests that organizations fare far better with a diverse workforce. We know that about NIH for sure. What do you make of the gender gap between men and women in information technology careers? Is there a gap? Or what do you think? What is, what's going on there? Sarah, do you want to give it a step first or do you want me to try? Yeah, and you know, I've been, um, when I came into this field, 
uh, there was 12%, 12% of women in the IT field. And now that number is roughly not at NIH, but I would say, you know, in the United States and globally, it's around 25%. Interestingly, there are actually now, if you look at IC Squared's um, 2019 cyber paper on women in cyber, there are more women in IT and cyber leadership roles than there are men, which is very interesting uh, and something I think we can have a big conversation about. But, um, you know, I think that uh, IT and cy I call it cyber, right? That's what the cyber workforce kind of encompasses all things IT, cybersecurity, Intel, all of that. The field is so big and we tend to think of IT in a very small way. I think a lot of people think of IT as like computers. They're not thinking about the groundbreaking research that's being done at NIH using information technology. They're not thinking about like how Dr. Brennan got into technology. They're not thinking about um, cyber forensics or uh, different kind of coding or strategic planning or governance or risk. Like the field is so big and we just don't do a very good job of kind of sharing all of the different ways that you could get into the field. And I feel like that, because we don't share that, because we don't give that breadth and depth of what IT or cyber really is, people have a very myopic view of what it is. And they, and they, just, sort of, they just sort of see it one way. And I, the, the, this kind of, the kind of sad part right now that we're seeing is we're seeing a high level of women leaving the field. And that's very concerning. Um, in fact, we're seeing that in, in many different careers, we're seeing a high level of women leaving the workforce and that is due to COVID and because women for better or for worse still carry the lion's share of responsibility for taking care of their family. So if you've got you know, uh, compromised folks at home you need to take care of, if your children can't go to school, it's a lot of the women who are leaving the workforce. So there's there's a there's kind of a dual challenge I see right now in recruitment and in retention of of women in technology. Well, I want to pick up on something that Sarah indicated, which I think explains the difference and the disparities of participation in what we think is IT and what actually is IT. So it's been much bemoaned that the percentage of, of young women graduating with, P, with bachelor's and PhDs in computer science has dropped precipitously since the 1980s. So women were looking maybe 30, 35%, 40% of the classes in the 1980s, and now they're down to about 15 to 20%. But the opportunities to understand, to learn, and to make use of information technologies have broadened. So the traditional training places are not the only training places where you can learn about technology and how it serves. In my home institution where I was before I came to NIH, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, the most innovative course in virtual reality is being taught in the school that we once would have called home ec. It's now taught in the Department of Design Studies in the School of Human Ecology, but it's because the designers needed the computer science knowledge to be able to accomplish their designs and the ability to have the right environment to train people at that intersection of design, visualization, and computation existed only there. Now, computer science is catching up. I would say there's a new school of, of information science and data science at, at, at the Wisconsin, and so they'll catch on. But what I think we need to look at is the broadening ways where information technology is shaping knowledge, work, and lives and how we're engaging people in those. So the fact that we're losing women from traditional training programs shouldn't be looked at alone. We should look at what is society developing. Now, I will still say we lag. There is a lag in, in both social recognition and social compensation for positions. Mm -hmm. So a professor of computer science makes five times what a professor of design studies in the School of the Human Ecology makes. And so needing to look at the parity of value as opposed to the parity of degree is where I see an opportunity coming for us in the future. The federal government is actually in the best place to do this because of our competency, competencies 
and the way we advertise for jobs and our J, JAs, JQs, I forget what that, that operation is called, but when I'm looking for a computer scientist in my lab in the NINR, I'm able to explain the, the role that that person is going to have independent of the degree that that person has. So we are, as we look for computer science, as we look for computer science support in the computer science job category, I must admit, um, we were able to work with HR to appropriately label that computer science education may have come from design studies, media arts, industrial engineering, computer engineering, not only computer science, and we work to look at the competencies and the content that built the skill, not the degree. Wow. So with that being said, what do you suppose increasing the number of women in computer science would mean to the NIH? Or what could it mean globally? Well, I believe women bring lateral thinking into conversations. And lateral thinking and information technology are not well aligned all the time. Our, comp our computational tools are catching up, though, with lateral thinking, with the idea that you can have multiple pathways to a desirable solution as opposed to a single pathway to the best solution. So I believe that by stimulating, by challenging, by pushing the boundaries of coding, of systems design, of architectures of our data repositories, we will be seeing an enrichment of technology where the technology will catch up with our scientific thinking. And I believe that will happen because of the conceptual framing that women bring to the conversation. The value of precision, single factor solution, and, and, um, uh, and, an, and a, a precise expression of language encoding has been supplanted with scripting languages, with multiple pathways to visualization, with, with using technology to complement human imagination as opposed to supplant human judgment. So I, I have great, uh, uh, great hope for a future that will only continue to be better. Wonderful. I totally agree. And that's the good news, right? <laughs> yeah, it really is. And, you, and there are more women coming into the field. I, I will say we've got some great opportunities, right? There are minority women are still highly up, underrepresented in the field of IT. Um, I think the statistic I read was that of the 25% of women in IT, less than 7% are African-American, which is heartbreaking in this day and age, it really is. And so we have a lot of work to do, but, and I hate, I hate to, to like kind of stereotype what I think are, are, you know, women's traits, but I will say when I think of IT and cyber and those kinds of fields, I think that this is, uh, I think of women as the OGs, the original geeks, right? And, and I think that, you know, we are so creative and we are such um, communicative, you know, we're, we, we're problem solvers, solvers, we're people leaders, we're outside the box thinkers. And so I think that growing the workforce with women here at NIH and globally is a tremendous opportunity. And I also think it's a really great opportunity for us to hyper-focus on recruiting underrepresented folks, just to bring in the diversity of thought and thought leadership in this field. One of the things that I believe is a tremendous and, and still not completely tapped opportunity is the pathway into health that information technology offers young people. Yeah. So you, we, we have in our culture, in the Western culture, we have so tightly aligned healthcare and personal service, personal characteristics, a compassionate physician, a kind nurse. And we, we, have, we have sort of restricted healthcare to be nice people doing complicated things for sick people. And, and not everybody wants that career, but there are young men and young women who could contribute massively to healthcare if they saw it as a high tech operation. If they saw by coding in high school, you can change the way we understand lung disease or we're able to reach families in rural areas. So I believe that we have, when you speak of untapped opportunities, Sarah, I think that we have the chance that NIH has the opportunity to do this, to bring these young data fellows and our coding fellows and our codathons, bring these young people in to see that they can use their tech skills in very creative ways in healthcare. And that this is a way to improve the health of our society to live out 
a social commitment through a technological te skill. Can we just, I'm telling you, like my heart's beating. That was so powerful. And so, I mean, what a call to action. Absolutely. I believe it's there. So Sarah, um, do you have any advice that you would give to women and girls considering a career in this field? Yeah. Um, and I wanna say, you, you brought some of this up earlier and uh, some of these ladies, but I would say advice for women and girls considering a career in technology. I would say, look at Katherine Johnson, the mathematician who helped put a man on the moon. Look at Grace Hopper, who helped develop COBOL, which is one of the first high-level programming languages and invented the first compiler, um, which is a program that translates programming code to machine language. I would tell them to look at the women in World War II who were behind the scenes decoding enemy messages. I would tell them to recall that it was women who wrote the code that makes missiles undetectable. And I would say this field is made for you. Do not be intimidated. Your mothers and your grandmothers and your aunties and your role models have shown you that IT and cyber fields are where women have. And I believe where women will continue to thrive. And whatever your passion is, I believe that there is very likely a way for you to express that in IT. Excellent. That's inspiring. I think that's great. I think the idea that you tap into a passion of a person and you guide them into how IT allows them to express that passion in the world is a fabulous way to bring young people into IT. It is the, the realization of one's own motive power in a, a practical way. And the motive power may be not simply creative, it may be financial. It may be the flexibility to run a family. It may be the opportunity to work from Hawaii. The, the IT careers were the first careers that became virtual, became distance, became digital. And so I encourage the opportunities that young women are looking for in terms of future lives to see how IT can enable that future life for them. Beautiful. I have one last question. And if you can sum it up in just a couple of words by finishing this sentence, the future of information technology for women is limit opportunity. Oh, see. This <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Dr. Brennan. I just Go well, ahead. thank you. Um, I Sarah, I would just say it's limitless. We don't know the future because they will create it. Oh. Really great. I, you know, limitless, I'd say full of opportunity. And, and as we continue to op, op, occupy more real estate and leadership in IT and take the opportunities in front of us, we have this opportunity to kind of bring in others um, and, and create this kind of world of leading ladies. I love that uh, in the field of IT, limitless opportunity. I love that. Dr. Brennan, Ms. Moffitt, um, I am inspired. Thank you for your time, for sharing your stories and your thoughtful advice. And on behalf of the Women's Engagement Committee in the Office of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, EDI, at the National Institutes of Health, thank you for joining us and look for future episodes right here and check out the EDI webpage at www.edi.nih.gov. I'm Joy Postel, Principal Strategist for the Women's Employment Portfolio. Until next time.